Take your seats. Well, the scripture before us this morning is, is pretty blunt and to the point, and I'd rather be preaching on something else, to be quite honest. But our dear pastor has gone away for a while, and he's left us with this passage. I, I guess, uh, I mean, it is so blunt that when the disciples heard Jesus say it, they went, oh, how are we going to cope with this? He's saying something that is right in the face of opposi- and opposite to what we're hearing from the people around us. And friends, it's exactly the same today. Tell people after this morning what you heard in church today, and they will be gravely suspicious that it was anything like the truth. They will be angry with you, perhaps, and they may even accuse you of outright prejudice and discrimination and lack of love. We're dealing with the subject of marriage and divorce. In the first place, divorce and then marriage. Now, just before we get into that, I'm aware of the fact that there are many single people here today, and single people get a raw deal very often in sermons and in church life. And I want to just notice you right up front today and say we are going to a scripture that doesn't deal directly with single people. However, be patient with us, if you will. Um, uh, I think this is a scripture that you need to know. You need to support marriages. And by the way, you need to know that it isn't the be-all and end-all to be married, right? When Jesus had finished saying what he said in this passage, the disciples thought, Lord, it's best that you're not married then, isn't it? Now, he didn't agree with that, but it would be easy to conclude it. From this, we could understand why Paul wrote later on in, in, in the New Testament to the Corinthians, those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. <laughs> now, that's a rather negative view of marriage, <laughs> but it carries with it a weight of responsibility that those of us who are married know only too well. By the way, you know, those that, that when the Lord Jesus in, in the parallel passage in Matthew 19 talks about uh, people receiving this word from him, he mentions specifically those who are single. He says some have been born without the desire, without the drive to be married. That's how they are. That's their nature. Others have been made and their desire taken from them by man so that they, you know, they don't marry. And then he says that there are some who are single, who are single because they honor God and honor his kingdom, and they want to serve him with all their time and power and energy, and marriage gets in the way for them, and he honors them. And we want to honor you too. I know there are some in the congregation here this morning who are single for no other reason that you've refused to marry unbelievers and you've not found a husband or a wife in the church, and therefore you've stayed single. God bless you. We honor you for that. There are some of you here who haven't married because you have other issues in life. Some of you with attraction to same sex. And you know very well that that dishonors the Lord, and you're remaining single, and you're fighting the fight. We honor you. God bless you. Go on with that fight. We will try to support you and be brothers and sisters to you in your battle. So let's say from the outset we recognize those who are single and praise God for those who are faithful to the Lord in their single state. Now, just listen to this transcript for a moment. It is an actual transcript of a genuine radio conversation between a U.S. naval ship and Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. Canadians, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canadians, negative. You will have to divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. 
Americans. This is the captain of U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. This is getting boring, isn't it? <laughs> Canadians. No, I say again, you divert your course. Americans. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. I say again, that's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. <laughs> Canadians. This is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> Friends, as we come to this scripture, we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place. There's a whole flotilla of vessels out there with all their command and strategy, media, politicians, world figures, all taking a course against this rock and this lighthouse who is Jesus Christ and his word. And we're caught between a rock and a hard place. When we hear his word today, we will know just how much we're squeezed by the world against the rock of the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did, did you notice recently in the middle of the massive upheaval following the vote to withdraw from the European Union that leading politicians took pride in the legacy that they've left us? right in the middle of all the political upheaval. Remember what they said? We've redefined marriage. We've legislated on human sexuality. And they've done that in the face, in the direct conflict with the words of Jesus Christ. And who can blame them? Churches are saying, taking exactly the same stance. Friends of ours in Scotland have had to withdraw from the Church of Scotland recently for no other reason than that the Church of Scotland now have voted to include married homosexuals in active partnership in the work of the ministry of the church. So we come to, Acts ten, uh, uh, sorry, to Mark 10. You know what's going on in this passage, don't you? These, these Pharisees are putting Jesus to a test with a question. Their question is there, clearly enough, in verse 2 of Mark chapter 10. The Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Straightforward enough question, you might think. How was that question a test? for Jesus. Well, there were two prominent rabbis who took opposing positions. Both appealed to Moses. He seemed to be the ultimate authority for Jews. The law of God came through Moses to them. So they both appealed to him, and the text that they're debating was there in Deuteronomy 24. Here it is up on our board. It's a long verse, but this is what it says. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, and she becomes the wife of another man, and he dislikes her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then his first husband is not allowed to marry her again. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. That was the text that they all debated. What did it mean? In fact, it wasn't the whole text that they debated. They debated just two words in that text. There it is, right at the beginning. A woman who becomes displeasing to him because he, what? Finds something indecent, something indecent, something indecent in her. And the two schools of, of Jews debated endlessly, what is the something indecent? And they, they, they go on about this, and they've reached different conclusions. They focus on those two words and, and, and what they meant. Now, the school of Hillel said it meant almost anything. Look out, wives. If she served up burnt food to him, for example, or if she talked so loudly that the neighbors could hear them, then that would be enough reason to divorce. 
Hillel was the ultimate liberal of his day. And there are many Jews who love that interpretation because it gave them an immediate escape route out of their marriage. Then, on the other hand, there was the school of Shammai, much more conservative. No, 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 said the school of Shammai. It is much more to do with direct adultery and sexual uh, promiscuity and so on. Well, whichever way Jesus answered the question, the Pharisees thought they would trap him into taking a position that would divide the crowd in front of him. That was the trick. Get him to come down on one side rather than another, then the crowd around him would take up a position, and particularly the women in the crowd. And he could lose a lot of people because he'd taken one side or another. So that's what they're doing. By the way, this is much more than a theoretical question, isn't it? You know that only too well. Many in the, cr in the crowd that day were suffering untold misery because of broken marriages and the treatment that they'd had from their husbands. And so it is today. You know, in the UK, in the UK there's some good news, I thought, when I first read it. We currently have the lowest divorce rate, divorce rate in this country for over 40 years. Does that come as a surprise to you? It did to me. Until you go on. You know what the bad news is, don't you? People aren't bothering to marry anymore. 42% of those who end in divorce, 42% uh, of those who marry end in divorce. And, and in the last decade, 30% have, have, have been uh, recognized in relationship without marriage. So that's, that's a whole change in our society and its outlook. In fact, um, it's noticeable that young, uh, older couples now are divorcing. Um, that, that, case, that comes as a surprise, and you wonder what's happened. Some say it's because we're living longer, or women are now economically more independent than they once were. Who knows the reason, but it's a sad statistic, isn't it? We're spending billions of pounds on clearing up the, the mess, the fragmentation that comes from family breakdown. Governments are beginning to worry about the stability of society in the years to come. This imposes a huge strain on everyone when the fabric of society begins to fragment. Well, what was Jesus' answer to this? Well, actually, his answer is very easy to understand, and that's the problem. I think it was Mark Twain who once said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me, it's the parts I do understand. That's about the size of it. Well, here's a part that you can understand. What does Jesus say? Well, first thing he says is, go back to the text. What did Moses command you? He answers a question with a question. What did Moses command you? Now, they answer that straightforwardly. Moses permitted, they don't use the word command advisedly, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and sent her away. And actually, that was their first mistake. <laughs> if you remember the verses that we were looking at at the beginning of Deuteronomy just now, Moses wasn't dealing at all with divorce. That was incidental. That was assumed. He was saying something quite different. He wasn't saying that you could write a certificate of divorce and send your wife away. This is what he was saying in that Deuteronomy passage. He was saying, husbands, you better think twice before divorcing your wife because once that's happened, you can't have her back again. That's what Moses was saying. He was protecting the welfare of women by saying, she can't just be shuffled around. One day I like her, one day I don't. One day she's my wife, one day she isn't. No, no, we're not going to have that kind of society where we're in chaos about who belongs to whom. You can't have her back again. That's what Moses was saying. Moses knew that men were divorced away because they're hard-hearted. He neither approves it or justifies it. He's regulating it. That's what he's doing in, at the beginning of Deuteronomy uh, 24. He's talking about the consequences of it. You know, the Old Testament tolerated divorce. It did no more than that. It's never commanded. It's tolerated because it doesn't impose any penalty for it, but it never approved of it. Actually, if they were to have answered the question of Jesus directly and honestly, you know what they would have done, don't you? What did Moses command? What did he command? Where would they have gone? Well, they would have gone back to the Ten Commandments. They would have gone back to Commandment 7. What does it say? You shall not 
commit adultery. That's what Moses commanded, or what God commanded through Moses. And then they would have remembered the law around that, where in actual fact Moses went on to say in the other legislation that was drawn up that if a person commits adultery and they are found to be guilty of it, outright adultery, you know what's to happen, is it? Divorce isn't mentioned. They're to be stoned. You say, that's pretty harsh. Capital punishment for adultery? Why was that? Well, we don't know altogether. This is the word of God. One thing that is perfectly obvious is that the society in which the Jews came to live in, in Canaan when they came out of Egypt, they, it, it, when they're in the wilderness, they were somewhat protected from the surrounding nations. When they got into Canaan, they were surrounded with people who were sold out uh, to perversion and sexual devices and practices of all sorts. The fertility gods were everywhere. Uh, you couldn't go for a walk in the country without seeing a pillar or a stone. You couldn't walk in the woods without there being some evidence there of, of human genitalia and being pictured in all sorts of ways all over the place. These were people who gave their bodies to animals and sacrificed their children. Those were the kind of societies that surrounded the, the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And the Lord God would have a people distinct for himself. He wanted his people to be holy. In every way, he wanted his people to be different from the surrounding societies. And that's why the laws that he laid down seem to be so strict, so absolute, so direct, because his people were to be holy people to the Lord their God. And that's why the law is as it is. Go back to the text, is Jesus' first word to them. But there, he goes even further than that. The next thing he says to them really is, go back to the context. You know the old saying, don't you? Well, you'll know it now when I've said it. A text without a context is a pretext. And it was so for them. They needed not only to go back to that particular scripture in Deuteronomy 24 and take a good look at it, because Moses was not saying what they were saying. They needed to go back to the whole context. What is this about? It's not about divorce. It's about marriage. What is marriage like? What does God want for marriage? What does he say about it? What does his word say? And he goes right back to the beginning, right back to the beginning, right back to Genesis. God intended marriage to be something other than they're pretending it to be. The only thing that was not perfect in the original creation, towards the end of creation, was that it was not good for man to be alone. Remember that? And at the pinnacle of creation, God created Eve he brought her to Adam. By the way, don't think that that was an afterthought. Women, you weren't an afterthought. You were always there in the mind of God. I think, I think it's told in that way because this was such a precious thing that God brought to creation. Man should not be alone. He will bring him woman. And in that relationship, that special relationship, God will bind human beings together in a way that they're not bound to anything else or anyone else. And God would create marriage. So marriage in God's sight, said Jesus, when you go back to the beginning, is about a man leaving his parents and clinging, cleaving, being united to his wife. United in mind, in heart, in flesh. There's no other relationship between human beings that comes anywhere near the relationship that there is between husband and wife. Not even the relationship with our children. Boy, if you're putting the relationship with your children above the relationship with your husband or your wife, you're not doing what God wants of you. We treasure our children between us. We do anything for them. But that relationship within marriage is the principal relationship of our life. I remember well a wedding the father had died, and the mother was to give her daughter away. And I was asking a 
who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the mother warned me beforehand that she would not answer. She couldn't part with her daughter. I understood that. She was a widow. Her daughter was very precious. But that's not right. When we're married, we part with every other relationship. In one sense, the, the principal relationship of life becomes our marriage relationship. That's the decree of the Lord. He leaves father and mother. She leaves father and mother. They become one. One in ways that it is hard to explain. They work together. They plan together. They pray together. They sleep together. They work in the church together. They contribute to the kingdom of God. Don't separate what God has joined, says Jesus. And he says sexual activity outside of this exclusive union is called either fornication, which is the big word to cover all sorts of things, or it's called adultery, which seems to apply more particularly to the breaking of the marriage bond. Friends, I, I've been thinking quite a bit about this, and it, it seems to me that, that long before God made Adam and Eve, enjoying as he did the union of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and wanting to reflect his relationship with men and women on earth. He instituted marriage. This relationship is intended to be the most powerful expression in the whole range of human relationship of what it means for us to belong to Jesus Christ. I wonder whether you've, you've explored that enough. I found that I hadn't. This was not, marriage was not a kind of afterthought, a kind of now, how can we get this done so that children are produced and humanity expands and so on? No, no, no. It's never like that with God. He doesn't plan after the event. He plans before the event. And his plans are always fulfilled. What was he planning here? He was planning this, that in the relationship of marriage, two separate human beings would come together in such a way here on earth that the extent and depth of their relationship, the enjoyment of it, the preciousness of it, the inexplicable weaving together of two human beings in marriage would be the best expression on earth of what it is for a human being to be related to Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's what it's intended to be. So this is why he put such high value on marriage because it is intended to reflect in a small way, but nonetheless in a real way, our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the church of those who know Jesus is called the what? The Bride of Christ. That's why when Paul is writing in Ephesians 5, he's talking about, I'm going to talk to you, he said, about a profound mystery. And he's been talking about marriage. And when he uses the word mystery in the New Testament, you know it means that something that was once hidden is now made clear. So I'm going to tell you about something that was hidden and is now made clear. The church is the bride of Christ as a wife is the bride of a husband. It's a profound thing. And, and when we're single or married here this morning, you know the best wedding day we're ever going to attend is still ahead, isn't it? It's when our bridegroom comes, when our Lord and King and husband arrives on planet Earth, and we're caught up together to meet him in the air. It's when we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that supper will lead to an infinite enjoyment of eternal union with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's true! And that's what marriage is about. That's why when we destroy our marriages, we're doing something... Well, Paul uses some strange language at times. When a man commits adultery, he sins against his own body. It's a strange phrase. Go and look it up. It means that there's something deep, something unique, something very precious in the eyes of Almighty God for those who are joined in marriage. There's nothing like it. That's why it's so precious. 
And by the way, do you notice uh, these verses are sandwiched between mention of children? Mentioned in, in chapter 9, 36, and 10, 13, and following. It's impossible to consider the subject of marriage without considering the effect of its breakdown on children. I feel heartbroken sometimes, don't you? At the tens of thousands of youngsters struggling today because the relationship between mum and dad is broken down. Talk to any teacher here this morning who has to teach children in day school, and they'll tell you what it's like. When kids come to school hardly able to think straight, angry, embittered, disenfranchised, not knowing which way to turn, really, and the teachers in the schools are supposed to clear it up. Little ones who are denied their childhood innocence, trying to cope without the presence and love of two parents. Man, friends, this is not a single-stranded problem. When marriage goes, the fabric of society is shaken. And some of you here this morning who are grandparents, you're suffering, aren't you? You love to look after the grandkids. You love to have them around and, and care for them. But your heart breaks for them because mom and dad are not around. How strangely naive this teaching of Jesus sounds today in our world. It sounds unsophisticated. When 12-year-olds are texting photographs of themselves naked to their friends, when sleeping around is regarded as a desirable experiment in preparation for marriage, that is commonly put forward today. It seems unimaginable to the majority of people that God would disapprove of same-sex love and marriage. I know, I know. People tell me when I, when I talk about this scripture, you know there are many good people who are homosexual. I believe it. Many happy people who live in same-sex relationships. Many people who've gone through the whole range of sexual experience and have last matured and settled down and they have a happy home and all is well. I believe it. In Jesus' words, they have their reward. But I also know the day is coming when we shall meet Jesus face to face. I know the day is coming when we shall account for our actions. Whether we're happy now or not, I wish them all the happiness in the world because the day is coming when they'll see him. And they'll know that what they've done is just dismiss him. They followed the flotilla of armed boats in opposition to the rock and the lighthouse. And you either listen and divert your course, or you make shipwreck. And if you don't make shipwreck in this life, you do for the life to come. And that's the truth. Now, he who made us cries out to us this morning, and he says to us, friends, this is a lighthouse. Change your course or make shipwreck. Don't let the world press you into its mold. All right, go back to the text. Go back to the context, says Jesus. There's just one last thing that we need to say. Go back to Christ. Let the little children come to me, he says in verse 14 in that whole passage. This, these, these verses in 9 and 10 are all about what it means to be a distinctive people of God in this world. He's, he's setting up a, another culture, another way of looking at life. And he's saying to, his, to, 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 to mankind, listen, let's show all the compassion in the world to our little ones. Don't shut them out. Let them come. Let's be a compassionate people. But let's recognize the rule of God. It is also in our interest to obey him. It is for our good that he has told us what he said. Go back to Christ. You know, these disciples were so concerned about the, what Jesus said on this occasion that they talked to him again, again about it in private. Well, they, they go behind the crowd, and when they get indoors, they say to Jesus, you know, what you said to the Pharisees out there, hmm, is there no way out? I mean, goodness me, Lord, that was hard. Isn't there a different word for us? Can't you let us in on an inside track as far as marriage is concerned? And he doesn't, he doesn't say a word that's different. 
He doesn't. He just repeats what he said to the Pharisees. This is the truth, he said. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. He wanted them to know the word of God. He wanted to know how things stood. They're going to be his ambassadors soon. They're going to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't want them conflicted about this. Just know the truth, he says. But Lord... But Lord, is, have you got nothing to say to those who are struggling? I mean, there will be people here this morning who are, who are hearing this word and saying, look, it's too late. It's almost too late for me. I've, I've committed adultery. I, I've, I've done this and that and the other. Doesn't, doesn't God understand my pain and distress? Doesn't he remember that, that I'm only dust? Is there no way back when you've fallen? Can I ever be forgiven again? Well, my dear friends, the good news is, yes, of course there's a way back. And even though you may have sinned over and over and over again, there is a way for you to be, to be restored. You could be like those at the beginning of, of, of the, uh, letter, uh, sorry, the prophecy of Isaiah, when, um, when the Lord addresses his people and he talks about their sins, their sins being like scarlet. Do you remember that? Such a interesting phrase. What's he talking about there? Well, you know, scarlet cloth was very precious. It was precious because it had to have a, a lot of work on it for its scarletness to remain true and for it not to fade in usage. So what they would do with scarlet cloth was to dye it and dye it and soak it and dye it and scrub it and treat it over and over again until the scarletness was part of the cloth. And when Jesus said to the children of Israel, though your sins are like scarlet, he said, even though you've repeated them over and over and over and over again, even though your sins seem to be so woven into your being that you can't escape from them, they shall be as white as snow. Even those in deep dyed sin can be rescued by the blood of Jesus, by the cross on which he died. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open, and you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where it begins, when you come as a sinner to Jesus. It's the way that that great King David went. You remember him. Such a great king, probably the greatest king that Israel ever had. He not only committed adultery when he had a whole harem of women, but he killed the man of the woman that he'd taken. See him on his knees as he cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me from all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know that my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, my dear friend. And what happened to David? He was restored by the grace of God. And what happened to him can happen to you. It's not too late. Sexual sin is not the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is for the Lord to go on wooing you and speaking to you and calling to you and beckoning you back and you blank him out. That's unforgivable. You know where that leads. It is to fly in the face of the Holy Spirit who is talking to you in your own heart and mind this morning. That's the unforgivable. But this is forgivable. Let my little ones come to me. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there are some here this morning who are saying, I haven't committed those sins but I'm at the end of my tether in my marriage. 
I don't know what to do. None of us knows what goes on behind closed doors, do we? There are some who are discouraged and dispirited. Does the Lord have anything to say to the broken-hearted? We're all in this broken and, and imperfect world. And friends, he sees the secret suffering caused by unfaithfulness and violence and cruelty. This is what he says to you. There is a way for you, too, to be helped and to be blessed. My child, I have placed you among people and have given you the gifts of my spirit to them so that they can help and support you. Let the body do its work for you. You need to confide in those you can trust. You need to get help and support from those who will understand. Don't drift on in the secrecy of your misery. Ask for help. Your marriage is too valuable in my eyes to let it die. Don't wait so long. How often those of us that have tried to help and have been involved, the time that it's out, it's too late. People have just let it run and misery and coldness has just settled forever. Sometimes separation and divorce is the only viable option. It is the last resort. The Lord Jesus did allow it on the grounds of adultery. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote later on in the New Testament, said that if a believer finds themselves married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever is determined to leave, the believer is not bound in such circumstances. That says something, and we have to take of that, account of that. But this is a complex issue. There are many, many issues around us, and leaders of the church struggle to make sense of this sometimes and to be wise counselor to those in need. There are many other scriptures that talk about the proper provision and care for those whose marriage fails. But, but get help from someone. Don't just drift on with it. And there's just one final thought. <laughs> And I remind myself of this, and I have done over the years. If I struggle in my marriage and find fault with the person with whom I'm linked, what is it like for the Lord to be married to me? I have loved you, he says, with an everlasting love with loving kindness have I drawn you. I will never leave you or forsake you. If you want a pattern of faithfulness, it's all about Jesus. About Jesus. Let's pray. Just in the quiet moment at the end of this service, let, let the Lord speak to you about what he said in his word. You have a sound and solid marriage, and God has blessed you in it. Then give thanks to him. If you find yourself broken and troubled about your relationship, though you may have prayed for it many times and you've sought help, just ask him again for his help and his leading so that you can find what you need in mending relationships. Don't abandon them. By the grace of God, see them mended. If you're full of pain and guilt and shame because of the way you've used your body and your mind, why not this morning turn to him who is calling to you? This is a lighthouse. This is a rock. Don't make shipwreck. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. Lord our God, hear our prayer. 
Write your word on our hearts and on our minds. And as we go back to those same situations at the end of the service, may we go back with a renewed conviction that we should be right with you, right with those with whom we live. Grant us the strength and the grace for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.